about scratch and physical computing. Um, first, I just want to thank um, Kelly. Not only did she let me use her computer, um, but also she did a great job. She had thought that she had the whole hour, and then she just found out she had to make some on-the-fly adjustments. So I was very impressed with that. Um, so why don't I go ahead and get started? Um, I'm Greg Benedis Grab. Um, I teach. I'm, I'm the head of computing and design at the Packer Collegiate Institute, which is a private school in New York City. Um, and I also teach at Hunter College. And I'm very excited. At Hunter, we're in the process of starting a computer science educator program. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking to you about um, a project that I did with 11-year-olds um, in New York City at the Packer Collegiate Institute. And it's, it was collaborative, and I'll talk about that. But before I jump into that, um, and that's the physical computing piece, um, I think it's really important to think about what this work is about. Um, and maybe sometimes to a fault, I spend too much time thinking about what the work is about, but I want to kind of frame it a little bit. Um, and in particular in this talk, I want to make some connections to the keynote from this morning, and I'll get to that more later. Um, so let's go all the way back. Um, and so there's sort of two questions that I think are important to keep in mind um, when we're talking about teaching computing, and maybe in particular with physical computing. Um, and what is, what I'm, I'm asking the question, what is knowledge? And so I'm going to go back to the Greeks. Um, Plato had a very specific um, understanding of what is knowledge. Um, he described knowledge as truth separate from reality. Um, and if you've ever read The Republic, um, he actually goes inside of a cave um, and uses this analogy to say that what we're actually sense perceiving is all a distraction. We really should just be going deep into our brains um, to understand what truth is and ignore all the stuff out there. Um, and I think what's most, what's often most exciting to me when thinking about these big ideas is, is some sort of dichotomy. So I'm going to compare that to Aristotle. Um, and Aristotle had an idea that reality or truth was in the world around us. Um, and so for example, if you're trying to understand what the idea of chair is, you actually have to look at some chairs. Um, and maybe even build a chair um, might be part of that. Um, and maybe that connects a little to the maker movement. So I don't want to go into great detail of the philosophy here. I think that's enough to kind of get us thinking about this, this question, what is knowledge? The other, the second and final question I want to kind of think about is what is meaningful learning? Um, and I brought two other more contemporary figures here. Um, in the US, we're obsessed with Piaget. Um, and maybe it's, it's fitting that we're here in France um, at this conference. But um, he, he's very considered the father of constructivism. Um, and um, in that view, knowledge is constructed in your brain. Um, and the idea of schema. Um, and how knowledge is constructed came out of that. Um, and so the dichotomy I want to introduce here is the person on, the, on your right, um, Lev Vygotsky, who also was a pretty strong constructivist. Um, and he focused more on language and in fact has a whole definition of how thought is the internalization of language um, and communication, which I think is really interesting. But his idea of constructivism incorporated the social environment. So it's not just what's going on, the constructing the knowledge in your brain. The construction of knowledge is socially situated. Um, and that sort of led to the whole movement of social constructivism. Um, and he also popularized an idea that's used a lot um, throughout the educational community, the zone of proximal development, where your, your ability to do something with, with um, capable peers is stronger than what you can do on your own. Um, and I think that's an important idea, especially when we're thinking about the social 
contexts of our classrooms and our learning environments. Um, and so I'm not going to only leave it at that dichotomy. I want to kind of connect it a little bit to this, to this morning in terms of Papert, because I feel like he took this constructivism a little bit further um, than the other two people I mentioned. Um, and I think what he, the way he took it further was that he looked at the construction, not only the construction of ideas, but the construction of actual physical things. Um, and he argued that that act was perhaps as important as the construction of ideas. And he called that constructionism, um, sort of countering it a little bit to construction, constructivism. Um, and I, I think that can help us think a little bit about what's involved in the kind of learning that happens in physical computing. Um, and then I'm not going to touch on all of the research that's gone on in the learning sciences. I think there's been a flood of research that connects to a lot of these ideas and have taken the ideas of Piaget and Vygotsky and, and Papert and even going back to Dewey. Um, and have expanded on these and made them more research-based. But there's one book I read recently by um, this gentleman, John Seeley Brown. I think he wrote it with Douglas Thomas. It's called um, A New Culture of Learning. And just to kind of touch on this quickly, um, he distinguishes between um, explicit knowledge, which is sort of the type of knowledge that can, you can put in a declarative statement from tacit knowledge. Um, and one of the, which, which is more the kind of knowledge you get from doing stuff and engaging in tinkering. Um, and one of the arguments he makes is that the, this, the explicit knowledge was much more useful in a time when knowledge didn't change so quickly, that it was, it was more fixed. You could count on knowledge being the same throughout your lifetime. Where now knowledge is changing so quickly um, that the tacit knowledge has become much more important. And one of the, one of the analogies I remember from the book was he said kind of the, one of the founding ideas in a lot of school systems um, is this, this kind of old um, proverb, if, if you teach, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he eats for his whole lifetime. Um, and he kind of questioned that and said, well, that assumes that the act of fishing stays constant throughout your lifetime, um, and that the, the availability of fish is going to not change. And, and I think this idea of thinking about change and thinking about new systems we need is important. Um, so I just wanted to kind of touch on those ideas before kind of jumping into kind of some of the work that I did, because I think I spent a lot of time thinking about the meaning behind the work. Um, so. In, with these sixth grade students who were 11 years old, um, we did a project with them um, using the Hummingbird Duo Kit. Um, who here has seen the Hummingbird Duo? Okay, it's made by Bird Brain Technologies. It's, it's basically an Arduino board um, that they've outfitted with some nice plastic here. Um, you can get some sense, it comes with a bunch of sensors. It's basically a way to spend more money on an Arduino board. Um, but one of the things that's really nice about it is it's, it's much less intimidating than an Arduino board in terms of there's the color coding, um, it's a little bit easier to use, and I felt for this age group that was really important. Um, and so that's part of how we kind of came to choose this platform. Um, and also they had already had a lot of experience with Scratch, and it connects to Scratch. So it's basically a tethered setup um, where it's sending serial commands to the Scratch board. Now, we almost had a disaster um, because I was testing it out right before the unit went, and it was constantly lagging and not working. And I wrote to Bird Brain Technologies, and about two days before the unit started, they updated the firmware, and then it was working. So I thought we were going to have to scratch the whole project, well, not to make a pun, but I thought we were going to have to cancel the whole project because it wasn't working. But they got it working, so I was very happy with that. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about um, what kind of work we did. Um, and we, were, we started with um, 
what I call a DIY approach. DIY approach. Um, and I think, I think sometimes um, in constructivist thinking, there's this idea that um, you kind of have to figure out everything yourself. Um, and, and I think that's true to some extent, but there's also a lot of things that you need to get resources from somewhere else. For example, to get the Hummingbird Duo working, they needed to go on their computer to this menu and click this box called Prevent App Nap. Um, and instead of spending a lot of time explaining, to be honest, I'm not even 100% sure why we had to do that. Um, but the point is, is that we were able to go on into a browser, look up how to set up your Hummingbird, and these were instructions were right there. So we had the students kind of engage with following directions, even though that's not always a constructivist approach to things. I think it's useful for students to know how to find directions when they need them to get to the next step so they can be creative. Because if you don't click this box, then the whole thing doesn't work, and it's not a very fun, creative experience. So that's part of kind of one of the approaches we took is just instead of setting everything up for the kids, show them how, some of the process of setting things up because that will allow them to do some things more um, independently. Um, another piece um, that, another approach we use that I borrowed from the art world um, is something called the limited palette. Um, so often in the arts, if you're starting young children with painting, you might give them the three primary colors and tell them to start working with those colors instead of giving them 12 or 15 different colors to work with. Um, and I think there's a lot of advantages to this because you, even though you want students to try and fail, you want them to get to the point where they find success. And I think it's easier to find success when you have a smaller set of materials to work with. Um, so for example, in this project, we just, I just gave them the LED um, and the board and the scratch. And so they could try a lot of different things, but there was a limited number of things they could try. And so they were more likely to come up with success without a lot of direction from the teacher. Um, and so then starting with a limited palette, they could move to getting more and more materials. Um, and I think that's a useful approach and it seemed to work well um, in this activity. Um, the other thing, you know, we, this morning we talked about um, the importance of projects. I spent a lot of time thinking about the types of projects that would engage the students. And there's sort of a balance here. We want students to be able to come up with their own projects. Um, but one of the things that I've learned from doing inquiry type work, both in the, in the coding sphere and also in science education, um, is that good projects are very are balanced in a certain way. And one of the balances is there needs to be a lot of creativity in the project. Um, one of the dangers I've seen in a lot of activities in elementary school, in particular in elementary school classrooms, is you'll have a project where all the students' um, projects look exactly the same. Um, and there, there's no excitement in the project because they've just, all done the same thing. There's nothing to share at the end that's different. Um, so I think a good project needs to have a lot of creativity in it. But at the same time, the students need to have enough structure that they know what to do. Um, and so that's sort of what I was going for in this piece of it, in terms of creating the pedestrian walk, crosswalk project that I'll talk about in a second. Um, I wanted it to have enough structure that they had a sense of how they wanted to approach it. Um, and again, a lot of this comes from knowing your students. Um, so students who have never done open-ended work before might need to have a more structured environment than students who have had a lot of practice in open-ended work um, and can do more, are, are more skilled at that. So the pedestrian crosswalk was exciting because students in New York City are always crossing the street. Um, and so what the, the project that I gave them was come up with a system to help people cross the street. And to be honest, it started with not that much creativity. They, most of them 
all used the colors of the lights that exist in New York City. They were red and yellow and green. Um, and they were controlling when they went on, on a timer. Um, but then, as they went through the project, they could get more creative, um, like thinking about, well, how are the pedestrians going to get up across the street? What system will let the, you know, how will we know when to change the pattern of the light so that the pedestrians can get across the street? Um, they could even think about things, well, what if somebody with mobility issues came to the street? What, could we use motors to think about moving people across the street? Um, and this was one um, thing, one of the students said to me one day, instead of the system being on a timer, it could be based on the car itself. I would use a distance sensor. If a car is X feet away, then the light would turn red for the car, and then the walk sign would turn on. So in these kinds of creative projects, they can start to kind of apply this type of thinking um, and be, be both creative and problem solvers at the same time. Um, and so they did a lot with forever loops in their scratch in terms of creating the, um, the light, but they could also create loops that had a sensor connection. Um, and in the, the, the way the hummingbird works is you have to use it with the offline scratch, um, the scratch 2.0 offline, um, and you at, through this, um, I think they call it the um, app, the hummingbird connection, it loads the blocks automatically into Scratch. Um, and so there's a, an additional set of blocks um, that you can see up here, HB, that's hummingbird sound on port one. And so you can control those different things, um, both input and output. Um, and that was pretty exciting. Um, and we also spent a lot of time, um, we would also look at certain code and go into detail. For example, um, one day I just put up this code um, and had the students think about, well, what might it do? So I would use these little discussions both to address bugs that students were facing in their code, but also to kind of get them thinking about ideas, like how does a conditional work? Um, and how, do, how could a variable and a conditional be used? But we often did it just by looking at a code example and having discussions about it. Um, and then I think another key thing in projects is that some students are going to finish early. Um, they're not all going to work at the same pace. And while I think it's great in a more informal context that students can, can kind of go in different directions, often in a school setting, there's a lot of time constraints. Um, and so I all, always try to allow for a lot of extensions. So this, it's hard to see in this picture, but this group had finished their crosswalk and they decided they really wanted to make a dishwasher. Um, and so they built this piece of cardboard up um, and they made the, um, the, the rack of the dishwasher at the bottom that shoots the water and they were having it turn and they were, they started thinking about, well, how does the cycle work and how will it know when to stop um, and all of those things. So I think building in extensions is an important part of projects as well. Um, another piece um, of the work that we did was we really focused on the design process. Um, and there's a lot of different models of the design process. This one I took from um, Design Squad on PBS. Um, but I think it's really important to be explicit about going through the design process. Um, and so we would talk about where we were um, as we were creating designs, whether we were brainstorming, whether we were iterating, um, and all of that. Um, and then finally, the picture didn't come up on this. Um, I, I think it's really powerful to find ways to connect the coding work and the physical computing work to other subjects. Um, and in fact, this, this particular part of the project almost happened in an unplanned way. I just happened to be having lunch with the science teacher for sixth grade, um, and we were talking about the work we were doing with, with the hummingbird, um, and she said, oh, you know, we're doing 
a unit on simple machines right now, um, and maybe we can somehow connect it. And so through that collaboration, we had the students kind of plan out how can they connect the work with the hummingbird to work with simple machines. Um, and this, this was a planning, you know, part of the design process. The planning phase, this student or this group thought they could use it to water plants in an automated fashion. Um, and they were drawing some ideas of how that would happen. Um, this, and then um, as they were, a after they planned out, they started to implement their designs. Um, and they came up with really creative ideas. Um, and they were able to implement these projects. This group was interested in creating a dog food dispenser. Um, because they said often no one was at home to feed the dog um, during the day. Um, and so they created this automated um, dog food dispenser using both simple machines that they made out of cardboard and various materials, but then they could trigger it with the hummingbird using either using sensors and motors. Um, and so that was, I thought that was an exciting example of kind of applying these two things together. Um, another group wanted to create an automatic cooking system and they were thinking about how it would know when to stop based on the temperature sensor. Um, and they got, not only did they come up with useful things to solve, but they also added a lot of um, contraptions to it that were not necessary, um, almost like Rube Goldberg contraptions. Um, and that made it really fun um, and exciting. So I thought that was a nice way to kind of combine that together. Um, so that's the work. So I want to kind of discuss this in terms of these four Ps that we talked about this morning. And I'm by no means an expert on the four Ps, but I had read about them. Um, and then it's, it sort of worked out well that um, Mitchell was able to talk about it this morning. But I want to use those to kind of think about what, what I learned from this unit. Um, and how it can kind of help us think about how to use physical computing. So, the fir and, and part of the thing about the four Ps is I think more than a theoretical framework, it's a good framework for discussion. Because I think what has to happen more is teachers talking about the way they're doing activities and have these conversations. And I like how the four Ps allows us to kind of focused on the types of conversations we're having about what we're doing with students. Um, so the first P, projects, um, kind of connects to what I said before about choosing those projects. And I think one of the, th I just took some bullet points um, from this article on project-based learning from Kratzik. Um, but I think what's important about projects to me is that when I first thought about project-based learning, I thought of the project being the vehicle for deeper thinking. Um, but I think the project is actually part of the thinking and the learning. Um, and I think that's an important distinction, that the project, it's learning how to find good projects and engage in projects is as important as the learning that comes out of the project. Um, and so I think projects was a big part what I saw with the students, that they were becoming more comfortable finding the right projects for themselves um, and finding how to get through the projects because they were ultimately excited about the project more than, oh, now I know how to do this. They were excited to show, well, now I know how to feed my dog when I'm out um, and use these kinds of things in a very practical way. Um, the second P, um, also really resonates with me um, because group work is such a big part of, of inquiry that students love to engage with each other um, and solve problems together. Um, and in fact, I think about six months ago um, in the New York Times, there was an article um, about um, some work about group work that Google is doing. I think they call it Project Aristotle. Um, and they tried to, they tried to number crunch group work. They, they threw in all of the information. And they tried to figure out which of our teams at Google is most successful. And they looked at all the variables. And they found that 
the, almost none of the variables had any correlation to the success. Um, and in fact, they were surprised that the individual talent of the people on the teams had no correlation with the success of the team. Um, the two things that came out of that study, one was empathy, that how much they listened to each other was a really important part of how successful the team was. And also the group norms of the team was really important in terms of success. And I think that we haven't, um, as in, in the educational world, at least in the US, we haven't absorbed enough how much, how important kind of thinking about this type of group work is. It's the education system is still so individually focused um, and that just isn't as relevant um, in this world of making and creating things. Um, and so I think thinking about peers and how we process this peer work is a really important thing in terms of thinking about our education. Um, the third P, passion, I decided to connect to Dan Pink. Um, and he, he did a lot of, he, he sort of, um, you know, a popular writer who put, put a lot of the research into a more um, public, accessible way. But one of the examples he gives um, in Drive that really hit home with me is he, um, he had, there was a study done, are you guys familiar with the, the spaghetti challenge? So there's this challenge where you give a group of people, I think 10 strands of spaghetti, some string, and a marsh and some tape, and a marshmallow. And you tell them to try to build a structure where the marshmallow is as high as possible. Um, and he found that, um, I think part of the purpose of the study is to, they, they showed that like these business people who did it did horribly at it um, and it all failed. Um, and in fact, one of the most successful groups, I think uh, Mitchell appreciated this, was the kindergarten students um, because they didn't, one of the challenges that a lot of adults faced was they would build their whole structure not realizing that a marshmallow is actually quite heavy because you think of a marshmallow as being very light. And when they put the marshmallow on top, the whole thing would collapse. Um, and the kindergarten students started with the marshmallow and started building up because they didn't have sort of these preconceptions um, about that. But the other thing that was interesting in this um, was they, they had a group and they said, look, we'll give you $10,000 if you have the tallest marshmallow structure. And guess how that affected the, the performance of the groups? Yeah, they all failed because they were under so much pressure. And part of the point that Dan Pink's making is that you know the types of motivation that we rely on in schools and in the business world are very successful at certain things. Like if you want someone to dig a lot of ditches, probably paying them more money, they'll dig more ditches, but if you want them to be creative and think outside of the box and accomplish things, paying more money or giving higher grades or giving the types of incentives that we tend to rely on doesn't actually work. Um, it actually lowers the creativity because it, it kind of pushes your brain in the wrong direction. So I think thinking about passion and motivation are a really important piece of it. Um, this I just had to throw my kids in here, also because I, I didn't want to take some online photo of kids playing. Um, but I think the play is really important. Um, and there was a lot of play in this unit. Students really enjoyed kind of just doing silly stuff with the hummingbird um, and playing around. Um, and I think we, it, we need to get a better grasp of how to incorporate this into the education system. In fact, I feel like it's best, in the US, it's best incorporated in kindergarten. Um, there's a lot of room for play. There's a lot of blocks and building. And suddenly, as you move up into first, in, into first grade and second grade and higher, the play disappears um, from a lot of the school system. And I think we need to figure out a way to get it back. Because I don't think, you know, there's, I was talking to some people about formal education versus informal education. Um, and a number of people t said to me, well, in the informal education, we have a lot of flexibility. We, you know, 
where in during the school day everything has you have to get certain things done and i think that's a mistake i think setting up our school systems where we can't have some of the benefits of the informal education during the school day is limiting how far kids can go and what they can accomplish. Um, and so I think the last thing I'm going to say before I'm going to open up to questions and comments um, is that I think as educators, we need to kind of think more about these four Ps. We need to think about the questions that I presented at the beginning. Um, and there's another term that came out of the Greeks um, that sort of has, ha hasn't been used so much in the educational world, um, but it was, it was really, it's been very popular in some philosophical cir circles. Um, and that word is praxis. Um, and praxis sort of defines learning in action. Um, and the nice thing about praxis is it's not just about learning in action, it's about learning in action for a social cause. Um, it's, about, it's about social change as well. And in fact, Marx, Karl Marx put a big emphasis on praxis in a lot of his um, writing about social change, which I think connects nicely to some of what Mitchell Resnick said at the end of his talk. I think ultimately, we want students to be learning in action and learning in action to accomplish things in the world. Um, and so maybe the word, I, I don't know if we, we probably don't need any more terminology to be thrown into this world of computing and education, but I'm making a plug regardless of that for the word praxis. Um, and so for that, I'll, I'll end here and open it up to questions, comments, or just ideas um, maybe there's, I would love to hear if there's other projects that are, are kind of exploring this idea of physical computing and the four Ps that you're doing. Yeah. This, this, what, this project was for six weeks. So it was, um, no, it was eight, I'm sorry, eight weeks. And we met three times per week. Yeah, three, so three times 24 hours. Yep. How, how did we finish? We, we finished with the, we, the, the collaboration piece. Uh, let's see, do I have that? So these, this, this, these pictures, these pictures were actually taken, so um, the collaboration project piece became the final piece of it. Um, and in fact, this was taken at a share with the families. Um, they, they set up all their projects in a big, uh, in the gymnasium, um, and they, they had to write a little bit about what it was, and then the families came around and they explained their projects to them. So that ended up, and that, that sort of was a, this, it, it came out of the moment. Um, we, I, originally I hadn't planned this at the beginning. It came out of just connecting with this teacher and seeing that the students were really excited to make contraptions that move things around. The, I, I think they they fo the the sensor they used here was a distance sensor, um, and so what they did was they said the dog would would walk past a certain place um, in the house, and then that would trigger it. So they I think they used their hand to simulate the 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 dog um, in the sensor, but then a marble went around this path and dropped. It, it was very, um, it wasn't very, it wasn't the most efficient way to feed the dog, but it might have been the most fun way to feed the dog. Yeah. Okay, so they, at my school, they, they do scratch in fourth and fifth grade. So they had, they had two, you know, two similar amounts, maybe two other 24 hour, um, 
courses on Scratch before this where they did some, some of the materials from the Scratch Ed site. Um, they did that in, in the previous two years. So they, I, I think with all programming, there's a huge range. There were some students who were still very uncomfortable with Scratch um, and needed support, but they had seen it a lot. And there were other students who could, felt, I felt I could scratch, could create better sc scratch programs than I could. <laughs> because they, they spent, you know, some students will spend thousands of hours doing scratch on their own time. <laughs> um, but that's not everyone. So a, a lot of it is figuring out how to kind of address the needs of all these learners. And the other thing that I didn't say so much um, that I think is really um, important is, and I think this is, this has been a huge part of the constructivist education mo movement. I think it's a huge part of the constructionist education movement. Um, it really all comes down to listening um, and listening to, to the children and really knowing what, who they are and what they need and really, really being invested in understanding their way of thinking. Um, and there's something really powerful in that that I think sometimes gets lost. Um, and one of the things that I think is interesting um, about this is that I think ultimately when we think about these questions, what is knowledge um, and what is effective learning, um, it's about bringing the, the action of the action and the, the thinking together. Um, and maybe that's what constructionism is, is bringing those things together. And I think in the educational world, that means that I think teachers and people who are in education environments have a really important voice for figuring out what, what the truth is and how it works. Um, and I know in the US, there's a big divide between the educational theorists and the educational practitioners. Um, and I think maybe through computing and constructionism, we can make an argument for why that divide is so divisive and not useful to moving forward to teaching children. So with that, I, d I don't want to make you late to lunch. So I'll end there. Thank you very much for coming.